Amen. So be it. Good evening. I can't see without these. Um, what we want to do tonight, what I want to do tonight, is give you a glimpse of some of the customs and behaviors, uh, kinds of things that we misunderstand, don't understand, from the Bible. And there are, there's a lot of them. Now, this is not a session on steps to study the Bible. Uh, that's for another time, and I'd be happy to do that some other time, but that's another four, five, six sessions. Uh, also, we have to start a little bit slow, because I don't know uh, who was here. There are more people here tonight. I don't know who was here at the uh, session that I have that I had before this one. And so the very first part of this starts a little bit slow. Can't cover uh, in four weeks the hundreds, hundreds of things that are customs, traditions, that are completely familiar to the people in Bible times that are unfamiliar to us. And we have to understand them in order to understand what the people understood at that time, because God was speaking in that language to those people and inside their customs and traditions. Uh, and so I'm going to start with a, like a brief review of something. Um, <clears throat> we'll cover some translational issues, some Bible stories, some scriptures, some passages from Bible, some customs, and uh, mostly some common misunderstandings from the Bible. For example, uh, Leah, the sister of Rachel, um, the Bible says that she was uh, weak of eye. What does that mean? Does that mean she needs glasses? No, it didn't mean she needs glasses. It means she wasn't attractive. She wasn't good looking. Rachel, her sister, was good looking. She was homely. Okay, so sometimes the Jewish language expresses things in a way that we don't quite understand. And I want to go through some of those. But mostly we'll be dealing with stories and with, script and with passages of scripture, uh, not so much translations. Uh, the first thing I want to look at is name. And this is the one thing that I covered last time. Name in the Bible. And you sing, we sing songs every week about the name of God. You know, blessed is your name. Holy is your name. How majestic is your name in all the earth. From someone who was here last time, what does that mean? What does it mean? Because we don't know God's name. J-H-W-H, those are the consonants but we don't know what the vowels are. So we don't know, in our understanding, what name God has. What? I am. I am. Yes, I am that I am, but that really doesn't tell us a name to address him. Uh, name, I used last time as an example. You can try the first slide. Uh, this is a song we sang this morning. Your name is a light in the darkness. Oh, your name is the word of truth. Oh, your name, oh, your name. It talks about God's name. Well, what is that? Next slide. I talked about Charles Manson and um, who was a serial killer of young men? Uh, Bundy. Oh, Bundy was one of them. What do you think of when I say Charles Manson? Murderer, okay. Actually, he's now dead, but um, all kinds of things pop into your head when I say Charles Manson, right? Or when I say uh, uh, Billy Graham. All kinds of things pop into your head, right? All those things 
are Billy Graham's name. All those things are Charles Manson's name. His name is everything about him. In the Old Testament, that's what name is. Name is all the things that you are, all rolled into one. So when we sing to God, blessed be your name, what are we really saying? God himself is all these things. He is amazing. All right? And so that's, that's how the Old Testament described name. Name was everything about you. It was everything that you are. Okay? Well, that causes us a problem in the 21st century because that's not what we think of as name. Name does represent everything that I am, but you don't know what that is. Uh, if I, it's different than a term of address or how we are known. How we are known, that's our name. And that's separate from everything that we are, although it represents everything that we are. Understand? This is a hard thing to separate, and I'm, I have to spend some time here. So, although in the Bible times, name means absolutely everything about a person, the word name, uh, they also were called something. They also had a term of address. Everybody had a term of address. Everyone was called a certain name. If I go and try to write a contract, and I write... Uh, where it says name, I write wonderful, compassionate, understanding, uh, clear-headed, brilliant, uh, and I write all these things about me, <laughs> curmudgeon. Uh, that, in the Old Testament times, that's my name. Everything that I can think of about me that's true, that's my name. But we don't use name that way. When we say name, we f I fill in Joe Zimmerman, right? That's what I write. What do you write? You write your name, how you're called, how you're addressed, your term of address. And so they're different, but your term of address also represents who you are as a person. Now, other people don't know everything about you. They don't know everything about me. That's good. Um, but there was, a, there was a term of address that people were given that was separate from what their name was. And their name represented their character, their history. Um, their likes, their dislikes, their pleasures, their level of grace, everything about a person, that was name, okay? But people also had a term of address. <clears throat> we would call that name. They wouldn't. That's just how you were called. And so I want to separate name of address from, I mean, a term of address from name. That's what you were called. But the term by which you were addressed that is, what you recall, that also tells you something about the person. There also is, hidden in that name, and not so hidden to some, what you're like, or some characteristics about you. They were in your term of address, or what you recall. So now the next slide. <clears throat> if, if you... Uh, what was, what was Peter's name before he was renamed? Simon Bar Jonah. What does that mean? Simon Bar, son of Jonah. Didn't have a last name in our understanding of the word name. And so he was called Simon Bar Jonah. Simon, the son of Jonah. So his father's first name, a real name, was basically his last name. Okay, so I would be Joseph, son of Joseph. But my father's name was Joseph. I'd be Yosef. Bar Yosef. Okay? Understand? Okay. If it was a girl, it's Bet. Uh, Bathsheba in, in Hebrew is Bathsheba. Okay? Bet, daughter of seventh. Seventh daughter. She was a seventh daughter. Apparently it was uncommon to have seven female children, so she wasn't named after her father or mother. She was named because she was unique in that she was a seventh daughter. So we say that she is Bathsheba. That's our transliteration of Bathsheba. Okay? Another way that you're named, or you're called, uh, is some great feat of... Oh, let me, let me go back to Simon Barjona. When Peter confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, 
Jesus renamed him. He na renamed him Petros, after Petros, which is a stone. On that particular information, Peter would be known from now on. Okay? And so Peter was renamed Peter. Before that, he was Simon Bar-Jonah. Or a great feat of accomplishment. For example, Gideon in the Bible was told by God to go out, tear down the Asherah poles, set up an, idol, set up a, an altar to the living God, and tear down the altar to Baal. He does that, even though his father was a priest for Baal. He does it. After he does that, what's his name? The people didn't know him as Gideon anymore. They knew him as Jerubbaal. Jerubbaal means the one who contends or fights with Baal. So people got renamed based on some accomplishment in their life. Another way to have them addressed. Okay? Everybody with me? Good. Okay, the fourth way is people were named also for their city of origin. Mary Magdalene, name was Mary. She was from the town of Magdala. Magdala is a small town on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. Now she was the Mary that happens to come from Magdala. So she was Mary Magdalene from Magdala. Okay? So some people were named for their city. And their city t told you something. Now, there are reasons why Mary didn't have a different name. I'm not going to go there uh, tonight. So, but people were named for their city of origin. Can I have the next slide? That's one of the ways people were named. Okay, uh, turn it off. Uh, in Hebrew, you don't have a slide that has a placement in a sentence, or Nazir and Naza. The next slide has Nazir and Naza on it. Okay, uh, Jesus, how many of you saw uh, that? Um, no, I forgot it. <laughs> there was a movie about the crucifixion. It was The Passion. How many of you saw The Passion? Almost everybody. Okay. What was Jesus called in that? What was his name? What, what was his term of address? Yeshua Natsiri. Okay. Why? Well, Yeshua... That's what he was told to be named. Yeshua means the one who brings salvation. It means savior. Okay? Yeshua is the one who brings salvation. Now, Joshua is a transliteration for Yeshua also. And Joshua did bring salvation, physical salvation, by accomplishing the Holy Land being given to the Jews. However, the second part of that is Naziri, or, and it comes from the word Nazir, I have to write this separate. Nazir, which means the anointed one. <clears throat> and so as a noun, Nazir, or Naziri could be used as, as the anointed one, that would be of God, and combined with Yeshua, it would be the Savior, the anointed Savior, the anointed one who brings salvation. All right? Mostly in the Bible, Jesus is referred to as Jesus of what? Jesus of Nazareth, right? And that's from the word Nasa. The word Natsa means, literally, the branch. It means the branch. Jesus, was, Mary and Joseph were told to live in Nazareth. Why? Because Nazareth, the town Nazareth, is from Nazah, 
which means the place where the branch lives. Okay, it's the town of the branch, the place of the branch. And so, Jesus of Nazareth is the one who brings salvation, who comes from Nazareth. All right? Now, that's all over the Old Testament, the branch. Jesus is the branch. And we got some of the quotes that we're going to flip up on the board to show you that. Oh, there it is. Not too late. He will not judge by what he sees with his eye or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness, the sash around his waist. Next slide. This is still the same. In that, oh, there are several places that was only a portion of, an Isaiah, of Isaiah's writing from 1 to 5, verses 1 to 5. There's also a, say, uh, a scripture that says, uh, he will come forth from the root of Jesse as a brute and save, no, this is separate from this one, and save his people Israel. No, that's not on this one. Shoot will come from the stump of Jesse. That shoot is Nadza. And Nadza will come from the stump of Jesse. Uh, David's, who was David's father? Jesse. Jesse. So what line is the Savior going to be from, the Messiah? David's line, right. It just doesn't say from David's line. It says from Jesse's line, okay? A stump will come out. Okay, a, a small shoot, not, not sa. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of might, the Spirit of the the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. That's the Natsa. Next slide. Next one. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand, what's it talking about, the root of Jesse? Will stand as a banner for the people, the nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time was the first time. Old Testament. Hand out his hand a second time to reclaim the surviving remnant of his people from Assyria and from Lower Egypt and from Upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath, and from the island of, islands of the Mediterranean. So God is going to claim his people a second time, and they won't be the same as the first claim. Go ahead. And it will be the Natsah that will bring that about. Go ahead. In that day, the branch of the Lord, Natsah, will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land will be the pride and glory of the survivors in, in Israel. The Natsah, the branch. Next. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king, who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior, the branch. So who is the branch? Jesus, but the branch is the Messiah. In the Old Testament, the branch is the Messiah. All right, same thing. Next slide. Listen, high priest Joshua, you and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come. I am going to bring my servant, the branch. See the stone I have set in front of Joshua. There are seven, seven eyes on the one stone, and I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty, and I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. In a single day, through the branch, the Lord God will remove the sins of the people. Okay? With me? Next slide. Tell him this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is the man whose name is the branch. And he will branch out from his place and will build the temple of the Lord. It is he who will build the temple of the Lord. And he will be clothed with majesty and will sit and rule on, that, on his throne. 
and he will be a priest on his throne. And there will be harmony between the two. The branch. Next. I think there's only one or two more. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will hope. So who is the second claimant to what the branch is going to accomplish? And who is the, Je is the branch going to speak to? The Gentiles, us. All right, next slide. I think that's the last one. Okay, turn that off. <clears throat> okay, so we know that <clears throat> Jesus is the branch, and this designates the Messiah. What he is called, how he is addressed, designates who he is and what he will accomplish. It just never was searched out. He is the branch. The branch is the one that will bring about the salvation of the Gentiles. The branch will be from the home of the branch. It's the only thing that ever came from Nazareth. Didn't you hear that passage? What good could ever come out of Nazareth? That's what comes out of Nazareth. The branch comes. So it's the Savior who is the branch. All right? That's what he's called. Questions? Go ahead, stand on and say it. I got to come to you. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Well, a, tree, a tree was symbolic of Israel, and uh, one of the passages that I didn't put up there is, Behold, the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Okay, Israel is coming down. It will, no longer, it will no longer be the people to whom God reaches. It, the people to whom God will reach now will be those who trust in the branch. But the axe is laid to the root of the tree, and there will come a shoot from the tribe of Jesse, from the house of Jesse, who will rule his people Israel. That's the branch, okay? Um, thank you. D don't be, uh, I have certain areas that I'm going to cover tonight, and I'm just going to cover that, how long it takes. If it takes too long, you can walk out on me. I won't be embarrassed. Uh, but um, don't be uh, shy of asking questions, please. All right, now, I'm going to change subjects. I'm going to talk about something else. In the Hebrew sentence, now I got a slide. In the Hebrew, Hebrew has an advantage we don't have. In the Hebrew sentence, <clears throat> they can place emphasis on something by where they put the phrase in a sentence. All right? So here's the sentence The king wanted to go to war on Tuesday morning. Pretty clear, right? Okay. Now, if you wanted to emphasize when the king wanted to go to war, you would say it differently. You would say it was on Tuesday morning that the king wanted to go to war. Or even, yeah, or even on Tuesday morning to go to war, the king, he wanted. That's how it would be written in Hebrew. In Hebrew, you read from right to left. That's the way the sentence goes. In English, it goes left to right. But in Hebrew, it goes right to left. So it would read, the verb is always first. So it would read that um, he wanted, that is, the king did, that's the subject, that would go next, on Tuesday, on Tuesday morning to go to war. So that way, they can place emphasis on certain parts of a sentence, which we can't do. We do it sometimes, but we don't do it other times. Okay, but it's always true that in the, in the beginning of the sentence, if a phrase is there, that's important. It also is a means of contrast. It wasn't Monday that he wanted to go to war. It, it wasn't Tuesday, I mean, it wasn't Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Nope, it was Tuesday he wants to go to war. And when? He wants to go in the morning. See? They clearly say 
a contrast between everything else and that. Got it? Okay. So if they do that, they do it for emphasis and they do it for contrast. Now, why is that important? Because a lot of the Psalms have misplaced phrases which we translate to be in English. Okay? And I'm going to use, as an example for that, I'm going to use the 23rd Psalm. And I'm going to use the whole Psalm. In doing that, I'm going to address some other things that are in the 23rd Psalm. All right? So put that up there. <clears throat> Everybody knows this. That's the other reason I'm using this. The Lord is my shepherd. There is no word for is in Hebrew. No word for is was. The Lord, my shepherd. All right? Predicate, nominative, subject. Equal. Lord, shepherd, equal. All right? I shall not want. I lack nothing. This is NIV, so they fix some of the stuff. I learned it with uh, King James. I shall not want. It doesn't mean you don't want anything. It means you don't need anything. All right? So I lack nothing. I don't need anything besides him. Yeah? In Hebrew, it would say, no, I didn't get to the part where I have a phrase out of place, okay? It's next. Okay. Uh, so, the Lord, my shepherd, I don't need anything. He's everything I need. Now, in English, he makes me lie down in green pastures. That's not what David wrote. David was a shepherd writing about a shepherd, God, to us. So things will be in shepherdese, okay, if you will. All right. It's the green pastures that he lets me rest. Where? It's the green pastures. There's a lot of rocky pastures. There's a lot of sparse grass. No. It's the green pastures, the lush pastures that God's let me, God lets me rest. What two things do we learn about God? He provides greatly for his people, and he lets you rest there, okay? So he feeds you very, very well and brings you to rest. That's what's important in a sentence. That's what David emphasizes. He leads me beside the quiet waters. No, that's not what David wrote. It's to the quiet waters that he leads me. He leads me beside quiet waters. Put the white away from my face. Closer. Huh? Okay. But it's the quiet waters. He leads me besides quiet waters. Why quiet waters? Because sheep are afraid of noisy water. You won't find sheep by a babbling brook. They don't like it. It scares them. Does God know that there's no reason to be scared? Of course he does. But the sheep are scared. So what does God do? He's considerate enough to take the sheep where the sheep aren't afraid. God knows it doesn't make a difference. Okay? So it's the quiet waters. He takes me beside quiet waters. So I won't be afraid. What does that tell me about God? Huh? He loves you. He's compassionate. He knows what bothers you. So long as it doesn't infringe on his holiness, he'll bend over backwards to make you happy. It's to... <laughs> I thought I was getting a high sign. He, re he restores my soul. That's the way I learned, learned this. And King he restores my soul. What does that mean? Well, if a stranger comes to your house, and they've been traveling all day, and they're dusty, and they're hungry, and they're tired, and they're just bushed, they're worn out. What do you do? You're obligated, as a Jew, to take that person in. You provide for their cleanliness so that they bathe, they clean themselves. You provide a meal for them so they're, they're fed, and you provide a place for them to sleep. When they get up in the morning, they're refreshed. 
They're clean. They're not tired anymore. They've eaten well. You've restored their soul. That's what you've done. You restored my soul. What does that tell me about God? He restores me. Okay. Pardon? All parts, yeah. He's concerned about all parts. He will restore your soul. He will bring you good as new. Okay? He guides me along he, in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Because that's what he's like. He will take me to where he is. Anytime you see righteousness in the Bible, well, most of the times, think of it in terms of right relationship. Okay, so he will cause me to be like him. He will bring me to that, to that path. He'll bring that about. Even though I walk through the, the darkest valley, I learn, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Got to stop here. First of all, the word death is ne not in this psalm. David never wrote the word death. He writes about a valley which is, it's hard to translate this, a valley which you can't see anything. It's black. Uh, it's sinister. It's threatening. It's dangerous. It's a place where you're at risk. It's, it's all these things all kind of rolled into one. But most importantly, you can't see anything. Okay? So even when, yea, though, is even when, even when I walk through this, this valley that's like this, I'm not afraid of bad things happening to me. How come? He is our security. But how does the sheep know? Remember, this is, a, this is a shepherd. How does the sheep know that he is safe, he or she is safe? I'm going to show you this. I ask you to use your imagination here. There are two things that a shepherd carries. A rod and a staff. This is a staff. It's not this big. It's only about this big. This is the best thing I had. And at one end, there's a blunt point. It's not sharp. It's rounded. But it's not like this either. So use your imagination. On this end, is a blunt point. On this end, usually, is a little bit of a rounded part, like a club. All right? In the right hands, this is a formidable weapon. I gotta get away from people here so I don't smack you. Okay? To the solar plexus, to the face, to the throat, to the head, to the stomach. The blunt, sharpened edge is thrust at a person. The other side is used as a club. Boom, the side of the head will knock a person out. A person hit. You ever see in uh, judo where they take a, a leg and kick it out at the side of a knee and they, they tear the medial collateral ligament and the, the medial ligament of the, of the knee and the person goes down. With a club, boom, the person goes down. I won't hit you. <laughs> the person goes down. And so this is, a, this is quite a weapon. In England, they used a long staff. I mean, I saw Robin Hood movie where Little John and Robin Hood got to fight on a, on a bridge or something, and the one won, and the Robin Hood didn't. He had a long staff. It was called a long staff. It was kind of like a shepherd's uh, staff. But this is quite a weapon. You can, you can hold off an animal with this weapon. You can kill with this weapon. Okay, it's a weapon. The other thing that a shepherd carried was a rod. It was three or four feet long, about like this, three quarters of an inch. <clears throat> and the shepherd would tap the ground with a rod, like this. And that would tell the sheep where to go. So this was a rod which would serve as a directional guide for the sheep. Okay? If there was one sheep that was a, like a favorite sheep, that was a sheep out in front, the shepherd would tap the sheep on the right shoulder if he wanted the herd to go to the right. He'd tap the sheep on the left shoulder if he wanted the herd to go to the left. It's important that shepherds were out in front of the flock. 
They led the shop flock. They did not drive the shop, the flock. This is not cattle. Cattle get driven, sheep get led, okay? The sheep know the shepherd, and they follow the shepherd, all right? Now, I've heard some commentators say that the rod is for protection, the rod is to discipline the sheep. That's not true. Sheep were never beaten with a rod. Never happened. The rod was said for direction. So that they knew where the shepherd was going to go. Okay, now let's say the sheep are going through a valley which is desperately black. You can't see anything. And they're a little bit scared, frightened. It's threatening, it's, it's sinister, it's evil, it's a bad place. Okay? What do the sheep, how do the sheep know not to be afraid? shepherds there. It's thy rod and thy staff give me comfort. I know God is here. The sheep know the shepherd is there. And so I'm not afraid of bad things happening to me because I know the shepherd is with me. Is that clear? Is that a surprise? <laughs> Must remember that David is writing as a shepherd about shepherds. God is the shepherd. So everything in this passage is about shepherds. All right? So the sheep are not afraid. Though I go through the darkest valley, the blackest place, most sinister, threatening place, I'm not afraid of bad things. Because you're with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They let me know you are there. Okay? So when you go through the darkest place, when you can't see two feet in front of you, when you're afraid for your life, do you know that the shepherd is near you? David says he's always there. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me. Some, some believe, used to believe, that this is you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I don't believe that. I believe that you prepare a table before me. This is a banquet table. God feeds his people. He takes care of their feeding. He is the one who nourishes his people. And I believe the next sentence starts with, in the presence of my enemies, you anoint me with oil. In the ancient world, the honored guest <coughs> was, a pellet was made about this big. It was of a kind of wax, and inside the wax was perfume. And the honored guest at the banquet had this pellet placed on their head. And during the course of eating, the pellet melted because it melted below body temperature. And the perfume ran down into the hair. Okay? In the presence of my enemies, the people that hate me, you anoint me with oil. I am your preferred guest. They know that you love me. Even in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. You place me as an honored guest at that banquet table. You put the pellet on my head. You let the perfume run down into my face, my hair, and my beard. You tell my enemies, I am your person. You love me. I am favored by you. What does that tell you about God? My cup overflows. I get so much, I'll get you in a minute. Let me get this one phrase. My cup overflows. You bless me more than I even can handle. Than I deserve, yeah. You, my cup overflows with your goodness. You pour into me so much that I can't handle it.
and talk too about the miracle of Jesus at the banquet, at the wedding, at heaven being a, a ceremony. He wasn't born yet. Right. But I'm saying, like, in the, to relate the words, you know what I mean? Is that what they're talking about? I think you're confusing issues. I th well, the only thing this is talking about is how God cares for you. How this is an individual thing. Okay. God cares for the individual sheep. Okay. Like a shepherd cares for the individual sheep. That's how God cares for you. Right. You are precious to him. But is there things that happen at a banquet that always happen at a banquet? No, this is, this is like a spiritual banquet. This is like spiritual filling. Okay. Um, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely... Goodness and mercy, I learned, love, it's uh, chazed, uh, will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to talk about that. Goodness and mercy will follow me. I once heard a person say, it's like two little puppy dogs following after you. Nope, it's not that. <laughs> That's just not true. <laughs> true. The word follow after is a radaf. And it means hunt me down, pursue me. God pursues you because he loves you to do you good. God hunts you down all the days of your life in order to bless you. When you run away from him, he runs after you. The Holy Spirit is called the hound of heaven for good reason. God pursues everyone he knows. He hunts you down to do you good. So your goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. And this may or may not be future tense. It's action started in the present, continued in the future. I dwell in the house of the Lord. Right now, I am dwelling in the house of the Lord. And I will forever. God, because he loves me, will hunt me down. You know, one of my favorite psalms says, uh, the steps of a good man are, are ordered by the Lord. And in that psalm it says, though he fall, though he fall, he will not be destroyed because God upholds him with his hand. That means I'm going to make mistakes. You know, though he fall, though he fall, he will not be removed, he will not be destroyed utterly because God will uphold him. God will not let you be destroyed. From his side, he will not allow you to be destroyed. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word dwell is an interesting word. It means to, not only just to reside with, but to make your abode uh, there. Uh, so if we read the 23rd Psalm, like David wrote the Psalm, we can see several things. We, we see that it's a shepherd, written about a shepherd. We see the misplaced phrases to show us that God will take care of you even though you don't have a good reason to be worried. He'll do it. That's what he's like. That's what he's like. Okay? So, that's where you are we. Uh, next slide. I'm going to shift gears all together now, again. Uh, this, this I talked about before, uh, how one determines age in the Bible. But I want to get to the next part of the slide, which is the stages of a man's life. How one determines age in the Bible. See, we can't tell really well how old Jesus was. Probably born in June not December. Um, when a male child is born in Israel, well, let me tell you first of all how, how we score ourselves. <clears throat> when I'm born, how old am I? Zero. When I get to be 12 months later, how old am I? I'm one. 12 months after that, how old am I? I'm two, right. That's how we score age, not how the Jews scored age. How the Jews scored age is when you were born, you are in your first year of life. So now you're five minutes old, how old are you? You're one. Okay. The next time Rosh Hashanah comes, that's the new year, 
everybody has a birthday. Then you're two. All right? So you could be born the day after Rosh Hashanah. You'd be 11 months and 29 days old the time you turn two. Versus another person who was born the day before Rosh Hashanah, who was two days old and is two years old on Rosh Hashanah. Right? Follow me? Okay, now, because of that, everybody has exactly the same birthday. That's why um, Herod wanted all children killed under three years of age. He couldn't risk it that somebody would be in that group and he knew that the baby wasn't three years old in our scoring of three years, but in their scoring of three years, he wasn't taking any chances, right? Okay, so that's how, that's how you score age in the Bible. <clears throat> well, then how would, how would you be able to tell how old an infant is from the day they're born when they're one until they're two on the day of Rosh Hashanah? Well, there are eight or nine words that describe the infant, which is sibling, child, uh, what's it called when they uh, crawl around all over the floor? Huh? Well, any of those words. They have a different word for how old the child is and the different toddler. Uh, you know. Um, Italians in the group? <laughs> that means stupid. Uh, <laughs> they're different, <laughs> different words to describe a child depending on what the child was doing at the time, okay? So they could separate if you were two years old and actually two days old from two years old and you were two years old, okay? They could separate it. Anyway, that's how you tell age. That's why we can't tell exactly how old Jesus was. Okay, now I want to talk about the decades of a man's life, the time of a man's life. Second part of this slide. Excuse me. Um, next slide. One of these is from the Talmud, one is from the Mishnah. It's a little bit different, translated different, but Jews held strongly to this. At five years old, one is fit for the scripture. Later, at 10 years, for the Mishnah. At 13, for the fulfilling of the commandments. That's when you bar mitzvah. Bar means son of, mitzvah is the commandments, son of the, com of the commandments. At 15, for the Talmud. At 18, for the bride chamber. So you can get married when? after you're 18 for a man. For a woman, they could be betrothed at 14. At 30 for authority, that's very important, oh no. At 20 for pursuing a trade, a calling. At 30 for authority, at 40 for discernment, at 50 for counsel, at 60 for to be an elder, at 70 for gray hairs, at 80 for special strength, that's where I am. Uh, at, 90, <laughs> at 90 for a bold back, that's where I'm going. And at a hundred, a man is one that has already died and passed away and ceased from the world. I mean, you can't do anything, okay? <laughs> Next slide. At five years old, at five years of age, reading of the Bible. At 10 years, learning the Mishnah. At 13 years, bound to the commandments. At 15 years, the study of the Talmud. At 18 years, marriage. At 20, the pursuit of a trade or business, active life is time of active life. At 30 years, full vigor, manhood. At 40, maturity of reason. At 50, for counsel. At 60, com commencement of agedness. At 70, gray, gray age. At 80, advanced old age. At 90, bowed. That should be down. At, a, at 100, as if he were dead and gone and taken from the world. They had a very strict set of rules for what you could do when. All right? Everybody had to have a trade. Before you were 30 years old, you had to have a trade. Even kings had trades. There was one king that made spoons, for example. What did Paul do? Tent repair, sailmaker. Right, he, he, he repaired sails. 
He had a trade. He was a Jew. Had to have a trade. What did Jesus have for a trade? Well, he was a builder. Uh, because the houses were, some were mud brick, some were carved out of stone, some were wood. So all of those wrapped together, he was a builder. So here you see God, Jesus, chipping away with a stone mallet, getting flecks of stone, hitting him in the face, cutting him, because he had to learn a trade. Is he ever going to use that trade? Does God know he's ever going to use that trade? No, he's never going to build anything. He's never going to be a stonemason. What does that tell you about God? Huh? He knows all. He will go any length to be known. How did that prepare Jesus? It didn't prepare Jesus. God had to get a job. What does that tell you? <laughs> God had to get a job. And why did he have to get a job? If you didn't get a job at 30, you are without authority. You can't tell anybody anything. They don't have to believe you. Why did Jesus wait till he was 30 years of age to begin to preach. Because nobody would believe him until he was of age. What does that tell you about God? God endured that just like he took you as a sheep by, by non-bubbling water. He understands that there are man's restrictions, and he will go to any length to be known by you. Any length. And so here we see God chipping stones, getting cut, working with a saw, cutting wood, making bricks, so that when he's 30, you'll listen to him. because they lived in that culture, not in our culture. Did God know that Jesus could have preached when he was 24? Huh? Of course. Who would have listened to him? Nobody. Nobody. Excuse me a minute. I'm digging. Okay, so what we have here from David and from the Jewish people is a picture of what God is like, don't we? Hmm? At least some of the aspects of what God is like. What is that? That's his name. That's his name. See, Jesus, as being, being called Jesus of Nazareth, could never be called Jesus bar whatever, because we don't know whatever. <laughs> he wasn't Joseph's son. I mean, legally, Joseph adopted him when he was 30 days old, but the point was he was not his biological father. So he couldn't be called Jesus bar whatever God's, quote, term of address is. But God provided that we will be able to tell who he is by where he told his parents to live. Okay? All right, now we have Jesus at age 28, probably 28 and a half maybe, our age 28, 28 and a half. Coming to John to be baptized. <clears throat> Next slide. So we know that John was from a priestly line. 
because his father was a priest, right? He probably been baptizing for about one year because he's just about that amount older than Jesus. And we know that John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. That it was so that people that were in sin would acknowledge their sin, and the Hebrew word is shuv, S-U-V, turn away from, or turn around, turn from their sin. All right? <clears throat> so Jesus at 28 comes to be baptized. He walks up to the River Jordan where John is, and he says, I want you to baptize me. And John says, you got to be kidding. I can't baptize you. My baptism is a baptism of repentance. You should be baptizing me. And Jesus said something which is very definitive and very much informative. He said, let it be so for righteousness sake or for a right relationship to exist. What happens? Immediately, John baptizes him. What happened? Why did John change from over here to over here? Why did John immediately, without hesitation, agree to baptize Jesus when he knew that Jesus was without sin? Hmm? Well, I'm going to tell you. I always say I wouldn't set it up like that. Okay. There are four kinds of baptism. <clears throat> Slide. There's, there's at least four kinds of baptism. There's more than that. In Judaism, we don't have any, we don't have one. Okay. <clears throat> there is baptism for the remission of sin, uh, baptism of repentance. That's for Jews at the time who are supposed to shoot, turn around, turn away from. It's a 180 degree turn. Shoot, to turn from sin and embrace holiness. Okay? That's John's baptism. There's a baptism of cleansing. Baptism of cleansing is for women who have just had their period and are not allowed in the court of women at the temple because they're un quote, unclean. Okay, so they go to a place called a mikvah. A mikvah is there's usually a stream, there's running water, can't be stagnant water, must be running water, and there are steps that go down into the mikvah. The woman goes down the steps from the mikvah and comes up either the other side or up the same steps after she's fully immersed. That's called a baptism of cleanliness. When she comes out, she can go to the temple, she can go to the court of women, she is not acceptable, all right? And it is called a baptism, baptism of cleanliness. Are these Jew or is in Jewish speech or something? This is Jewish terms, yeah. Jewish terms. Yeah. Either, uh, so more or less, this is the cleansing of the women. That's more outwardly cleansing. That wasn't a it's symbolic. Even, even, even uh, 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 for the remission of sins, it's symbolic. It's a public acknowledgment of something that happened. It doesn't... You aren't saved by baptism. It's a public acknowledgement that you accepted Christ. Right. For us, not, now we're going back 2,000 years, okay? Yeah, so okay. Today, that even come close. There's a baptism of conversion, which is close to what we have, and it's a public acknowledgement of death of the old life and beginning of the new life. That is where a non-Jew would go into a mikvah. They would acknowledge that their old life has died, and they come out of the mikvah, same thing as the woman, they come out of the mikvah after being fully immersed, and they would be accepted as Jews. They profess Judaism, they go into the mikvah, come out of the mikvah, and they are accepted as Jews. They have declared their non-Jewish life dead, and their Jewish life now alive. Okay? The fourth is a baptism of consecration. What do you think that is? What? You were close. What I heard, you almost had it. Oh. 
wholeheartedly is, is the issue, yes, it's not only for people, it's for everything. If there was a basin <clears throat> that was to be used in a temple for the priests to wash their hands, the basin had to be baptized. If there was an altar, it had to be baptized. The word is immersed by baptism. It had to be immersed. Why was that done? From that point on, that vessel, if it's a laver or a bowl, from that point on, it could only be used in the service of God himself. Everything in the temple had been baptized because everything was then exclusively for the use of the Lord. Anything that begins to be exclusively for God's use must be immersed and symbolically cleansed. All right? So Jesus comes to John, and Jesus said, I want you to baptize me. And John says, I can't, I can't do that. My baptism is a baptism of repentance. And Jesus said, let it be so, so that a right relationship might exist. What right relationship? From that point on, Jesus is exclusively dedicated to the Lord God. It's a baptism of consecration. It's a baptism to consecrate the vessel, or in this case, to consecrate a man to be exclusively for God's service. Do we ever see Jesus going back to being a carpenter? Do you ever see him doing anything from that point on that was not in the service of his father? No. Why? The baptism of consecration. He was consecrated exclusively to the service of God. All right? <clears throat> when Jesus said to John, well, let it be so, so the right relationship can exist. It's the right relationship with the Father. Let me be consecrated so that I may fully serve nothing else and no one else and no other thing than God himself. All right? Yeah. Yeah, that's why I said John was a, from the line of priests. As soon as Jesus said that, John knew that everything in the temple has to be baptized. He knew that as a priest, he had to immerse everything that was used exclusively for God. That's why I, that's one of the reasons that it's fortunate that John was, in fact, I'm sorry, one of the reasons that we're, it's fortunate that John was from the line of priests was that he would have understood that. And anyone that's reading this would understand John would have known this. He would have known this. He just had to be reminded by Jesus. Okay? And so Jesus reminds him, let this be so, so that a right relation can exist between me and the Father. I'm exclusively now in service. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. No, our baptism, as we understand baptism, repentance? baptism, well, it's repentance, but it's, it's the burial of the old man and the rising of the new man. Oh, it's the third one. With, um, it's a baptism of conversion. Conversion from sinful life into a non-sinful life, allegedly. <laughs> I haven't got there yet. I don't know about some of you guys. Okay, so what we did tonight, this evening, and... Fortunately, that worked out really good. Um, I tried to introduce you to some of the ways that the people thought and behaved at the time that this was written, this book. I mean, at the time that Jesus lived. That's what I'm going to do next time, and the next time, and the next time. We're going to look at different kinds of things that 
might mean something different to us or that we could understand better if we only understood how they thought and how they behaved. All right? And that's going to be my emphasis. Not so much how to study the Bible. How to study the Bible is something that we'll do at another session. Now, there's no way, there's hundreds and hundreds of these. There's no way that I can do hundreds and hundreds of these. But I can pick out a number that can help understand that's a different culture and they do different things and it's written the way they understand in the Bible, not the way we understand necessarily. Okay? It, it's a little different. It can be different. But with their insight, we can gain a lot of understanding about what God's like. You see? I know from David's psalm that, in fact, God will do almost anything that is not contrary to his nature in order for, to reach me. He will do anything. He will go to any length. Do stuff that he knows is absolutely dumbness on my part. <laughs> but he'll do it. I know different things about him. Okay, and I can understand some of these things that have puzzled students for years and years. Like, why would Jesus end up getting baptized? He really doesn't have any sin. Well, everything and exclusively for the Lord's service has to be immersed and baptized and consecrated. And so it would only be right for Jesus at the age of 28 and a half, probably, to stop from the trade, which he didn't have to do to begin with, except that God wanted to be able to reach us and be baptized. From that point on, he had only one purpose. From that point on, he had only one message. From that point on, he had only one mission. To reach you. To reach me. All right? We can gain a better picture of God by understanding the language of customs and traditions that God chose that language for a reason. You know, the Hebrew language is kind of like a picture language. It, it paints a picture in your head, and then you react to kind of that picture. When I was talking about the sheep, didn't you picture sheep in a grassy meadow? Didn't you picture that? When I was talking about by a babbling, didn't you picture them by a babbling brook? I mean, didn't you picture that? When I talk about Jesus going to John to get baptized, don't you picture that in your head? It's a picture language. It, it paints a picture, and then you react to the picture. A lot of places, not everywhere, but a lot of places. Okay? Well, we'll talk about that in the future. Okay? And unless you have questions, I'm finished for tonight. Have you any questions? Yeah? Um, some of this baptism stuff that we were studying, um, before Jesus' time, before Jesus was born, um, a lot of that baptism, or would you say that was that more outwardly thing than the inwardly baptism? <coughs> Uh, let me put it this way. Um, what's the word I want to use? A outwardly a different word. Um, uh, well, let me take the baptism of consecration. The expression or a ritual kind of thing. It's then, it's it's to acknowledge something. It's to represent something. Right. It's to symbolize something. Right. There's no temple, so how are you going to baptize a laver that you're going to use to wash your hands for a temple that doesn't exist? So. Are we bound by that now? And what year is this, 2017? Are we bound by that? No. Is baptism symbolically the same thing as it was for conversion? Yeah, it really is. It's a public acknowledgement of what has just happened to you. Does it save you? Does baptism save you? No. And so on the day of Pentecost, Peter says, they say, what must we do to be saved? And he said, repent and be baptized. Well, you must repent, turn around, shuv, okay, stop that. And a public acknowledgement that that's happened. You make a statement, it's happened. You didn't, I'll tell you what you didn't have in his time. You didn't have, now with eyes closed and heads bowed, sneak your hand up. You didn't have that. Okay? 
Baptismal cleansing, yeah, it's only for it's only for men. It's after a menstrual cycle, yeah. That's because the woman was not allowed in the temple, even in the court of the women, unless she was not in her period at the time, or if she had not been cleansed after a period ended. It's symbolic. The point was she. Two days after her menses ended, after after no longer bleeding, was she any less clean? No, she wasn't any less clean. The point is, symbolically represents something. Okay, God was saying, you know, if if there's a, if you had a, if you had a, if you have leprosy, and you're cured of leprosy, what did Jesus say to the lepers right away? Go present yourself to the priest. Show them that you're no longer leprous, and you can get in the temple. Okay. Are we done? Yeah. He was Yeshua. That's, Joshua's a transliteration of Yeshua. No, no, no. He had his name changed. Moses changed it after he came back from spying with the twelve. And um, was it because of his protection? Because the rabbis say it was protection-wise. But if he lived in the same community, how can Remember that one of the reasons that you're renamed is some feat, some accomplishment that you have, like Gideon was Jerubbaal some accomplishment. If Moses recognized that as an accomplishment and would rename him according to that accomplishment, then that so would be appropriate. Be no. Well, well I, don't, I don't know if Moses saw that as his as protection being the accomplishment. I don't know that. I don't, and I don't presume to know either. Okay, you all right? Psalm 23. You see it differently? Praise God, it's a, it's a shepherd's poem. 